we're looking at Alvin Plantinga's views on modality, in particular, what he says about possible worlds and how he uses possible worlds to explain possibilities and necessities. So in the defense of the de re de dicto distinction that Plantinga makes, first of all, there are the arguments of Quine against this distinction, but Plantinga addresses another argument by Neil, who concludes that there is no such thing as de re modality, that it doesn't make sense. So first of all, we assume that 11 is necessarily prime. Clearly it's prime. And if anything had a property necessarily, it seems like this would be an example, 11 being necessarily prime. Now, consider Paul's favorite number, and let's just say that's not necessarily prime. I mean, Paul's favorite number could have been 12, it could have been 13, E also, but it, you know, it didn't have to be prime number, but let's do say that Paul's favorite number is in fact 11. Now, the problem here is from one, when we have Paul's favorite number being 11, now we're saying that that's not necessarily prime, but of course we are assuming that 11 is necessarily prime. And so we have that contradiction. And so being necessarily prime is not really a property after all. This whole idea of necessity and modality doesn't make sense according to Neil. Well, how does Blanaga respond to Neil? First of all, he says, look, there's an equivocation. One, that claim that Paul's favorite number is not necessarily prime, that's taken de dicto, that's taken about the sentence. That's when you're imagining it's possible that Paul could have had a different favorite number. Uh, but the assumption that 11 is necessarily prime, that is taken de re. So if there were consistency in the way that the necessity is used, then the argument fails. I mean, we have one case of de re and one case of de dicto, those are not the same. So premise one taken de re is false. So this is not a successful argument because it equivocates on being necessarily prime. In addition, that de re de dicto distinction has a long and strong philosophical history that goes way back to at least Aristotle. Aristotle made this distinction when he was responding to concerns about the sea battle in De Interpretatione. It was used by Augustine and Aquinas and G.E. Moore. There are others who have used this de re de dicto distinction with reasonable success and so we have reason to go ahead and think that these things exist. So how do we extrapolate? How do we explain de re and de dicto modality? How do we provide a framework for doing logic? We use possible worlds. Now for planning a possible worlds are maximal states of affairs. And for any state of affairs, a state of affairs would just be the way things are, to put it in simple terms. A pen being on a table, that would be a state of affairs. Okay, so a maximal state of affairs means that for any other state, state of affairs, S, S is going to be maximal. If and only if for every state of affairs, S prime, whatever you want to call that, S includes S prime, it's part of that larger state of affairs, or it precludes S prime, it rules out that state of affairs. So states of affairs are abstract things. That's like propositions. For planning a propositions are abstract things. So these are somewhat comparable in that sense. However, they are different. States of affairs describe the way things are, without necessarily being true or false. You assign those attributes to propositions. Now, objects or individuals exist in possible worlds. Now, how might that go? How does that work? Objects are concrete. We just said possible worlds are abstract because they're maximal states of affairs. Well, an object X exists in W, a, a possible world we'll call W, if and only if if W had been actual, X 
would have existed. So that's what we mean when we say that the object X exists in a possible world. We mean that if that possible world had obtained, if it had been actual, then X would exist. So just to clarify, to say that X exists in W is not to say that X exists, period, right? Instead, to say that X exists in W is to say that X would have existed had W been actual. Or it's impossible for W to be actual and X fail to exist. So there's this distinction between X exists and X exists in W. These are two different things. All right, we need to cover a little bit more ground with our terminology here. I've mentioned state of affairs obtaining, right? Obtaining or actuality for states of affairs is, is comparable to truth for propositions and properties, okay? An object has a property P essentially, it must have it, if and only if that object has P in every world in which it exists. So maybe that would be Socrates, and P, the property being a human. So Socrates would be a human in every world in which Socrates exists. And then we would say being a human is an essential property of Socrates. Now, as a consequence, all objects have existence essentially. Okay, but that's not to say that, that they are necessarily existent. Those are two different things, right? To have existence essentially means that in every world in which it exists, it has the property of existence, right? But that doesn't mean that it exists in every possible world. That would be necessary existence. So some essential properties are very trivial. Being a number or being a cow is trivial for the number 17. It would also be trivial for a cow. Um, some properties are not trivial, such as being the teacher of Plato in Alpha. That's a property that's fairly significant. That's a property of Socrates uh, that has historical significance. So a little bit more vocabulary then, essences. An essence of S is something that is essential to S. S has to have it. And it's necessarily unique to S. Let's, let's cash that out, okay. If it's essential to S, that means if S exists, it has that property. If, X ex if S exists in any possible world, it's going to have that property, that essence. And it's necessarily unique. That, that conjunct means that it's equivalent to the claim that S has the essence E. And in no world is there an object distinct from S that has E. S is the only thing that has E, its essence. An object has a property P contingently, we would say, if and only if it has P in the actual world, otherwise it doesn't have P, right? So it has to have it in the actual world, but not in some other world in which it exists. So uh, to say that I am wearing a blue shirt, that would be a contingent property. What does that mean? It means that I have the property in the actual world, but there's some other world in which I exist in which I'm not wearing a blue shirt. And so that's our conception of a contingent property that's going to obviously be in contrast with an essential property. Okay, so a little bit more. What about proper names? Proper names actually express essences, according to Plantinga. So this is a, a little bit unique to Plantinga. So when we say Socrates, Socrates expresses the essence of Socrates, the person. And that means that proper names express properties that are instantiated by the same objects in every world, if it's instantiated at all, okay, in that world. So we'll, we'll clarify this just a little bit more in part two when we talk about uh, contingent existence, necessary existence, trans world identity in particular. Uh, but for now, 
Uh, let's just say one other thing about proper names. They're not abbreviations for definite description. So uh, Russell, uh, Kripke, other people have had this discussion about whether names are actually shorthand for definite descriptions. Russell and Kripke say no, uh, proper, proper names are not abbreviations. So you can't say that Socrates is just the definite description uh, teacher of Plato because that uh, description might hold of somebody else in some other possible world. Even though it holds of Socrates in this world, it may not in some other possible world. So for Planiga, when we talk, when we use proper names, and we could name anything, by the way, we could name objects, we could name a pen, we, we could name other things, we could name elements and so on. Those proper names express essences of what we're talking about. Okay, keep in mind before we go to part two that modal distinctions are not epistemic distinctions, they are metaphysical distinctions. Now one implication of that is that we could uh, have a posteriori, let's try that again, a posteriori discoveries of necessary truths. So as the story goes, uh, Venus was at once called, one time called the evening star and unbeknownst to the people at the time, the morning star because they thought there were two different stars, one the morning star, one the evening star, one they called Hesperus, one they called Phosphorus. In actuality, they were both Venus. So the claim that Hesperus is identical with Phosphorus is that that discovery that Hesperus is identical with Phosphorus, it's just expressing the same proposition as Phosphorus is identical with Phosphorus, which is expressing the same proposition as Venus is identical with Venus, right? So that is a necessary truth, obviously. Venus is identical with Venus is a necessary truth, but at one time that was discovered through a posteriori means. And so even though it's typical that a priori truths match with necessary truths, that doesn't always has to have to be the case. And of course not. One, we're talking about epistemic concerns, how we find things out. And in the other case, we're talking about metaphysical concerns, what must be the case, what might be the case, what might not be the case. Okay, in part two, we'll look at trans world identity. We'll consider some objections to Planiga from the perspective of David Lewis, and we'll consider some more objections to Planiga, and of course, some responses from the perspective of Planiga.